as we go through the diagnostic phase, one of the more challenging things is we come across people who are competent and who do understand the barriers, but for some reason, are no, they, they don't care. They don't care enough to make sure that they're in play and, and they're functioning. So that whole logic of, well, it won't happen here or it won't happen to me is more prevalent. And then probably more challenging is, is that there's lots of people who genuinely do care, but they don't know what they don't know. So they're expending lots and lots of energy, but they're expending the energy in the wrong places in order to keep the asset safe as well as the people that's within it. And this is, this is the space from, from an optimist seventh generation perspective that we uh, are, are turning our face to influence this area. So how do you make people competent? The information is already available. We don't need to create it. It's actually within the safety case. It's within the coma plan. So you actually bring it out and use some of the tools and techniques that we've got, and then actually by applying care and, and having that as part of your cultural norm, then mobilizing people to actually behave the way that you've actually said that you're going to behave uh, within your license to operate documents. So that, that actually becomes useful. It actually becomes useful during the training to actually have people reflect on what parts of the chronic unease space that they're in. Do I need to know more or do I need to care more? It's a, a, a good uh, reflective point. I'll actually put this up because it's, a, <coughs> it's something that's very familiar to the industry. It's been around for a while, uh, James Reason's Swiss cheese model. And it's actually a physical, if you want, representation of the aspects of the resilience model, particularly the way that we use it in the training room. But one of the things, and it's the reason why I've put it up here, that's quite interesting about this, is when we are in the workshop, one of the breakouts that's done with those who turn up is we ask them about what are the prevent barriers that are in play in the place that they work, not in their company, where they work. And they've actually got to populate this, it's huge on the wall, they've actually got to populate it with post-its, what the physical, what the procedural, what the behavioural ones are. And they keep doing that. And then we have a conversation about that, and then we ask them, knowing that that's what should be there, which ones are actually not functioning or which ones aren't currently in play, and they actually go and take them back off. Uh, and if I know that one of the euphemisms that's used in the training industry is that you're actually trying to create light bulb moments for people where they actually have a realisation, and I don't think it, it, it would be controversial to say that some people have a lighthouse moment when they actually step back and realise how lacking in defence against some significant hazards that they are when they're at work, but more profound than that, that they are actually <coughs> doing this themselves and taking them off. Yeah. So that actually motivates a, a completely different uh, level of thinking as well, and then we're actually starting to make a line of sight between how somebody thinks, behaves and acts and how that then actually manifests itself and the, the levels of protection that's in play in their, in their workplace. And if we can actually make that bridge, then we can actually start to influence people to move away from behaving like that. So that's one of the, the, the powerful parts of, of, of the workshop. And if at that point I would suggest if they haven't, they haven't got it, uh, they're not going to get it. Uh, and, and, and we as an industry need to then have a really deep look at ourselves about whether we've actually got the right people in play, particularly when they've got levels of authority. So, And lastly, this is the, 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 the last slide that I've got. This is a thing that, it's a model that we actually use generally when we're doing diagnostics and offering feedback when we go and do remeasure as well, where we're actually trying to take people from a, a awareness to advocacy. So is somebody aware of something? That might be as much as what they are. So we'll actually talk about the, the subject matter at hand. How much do you know about major accident hazards? That's the question that we're asking when people come through. Uh, quite a lot of the times, if they're aware, th th then that might be a good day. You know, th they, they know about it. They know that there's a safety case. There's n they know that there's such a thing as a safety case. They know that there's such a thing as a coma plan. Then you take that to the next level. Do you understand? Do you properly understand what's inside it? what it's saying, how it's meant to mobilise your behaviour and motivate how you go about your thinking. 
no a lot of evidence to support that when we're actually looking in that space. So this programme is actually designed to close the gap between awareness and understanding. If we can get people to properly understand, start to functionally execute the content, uh, then we can actually start to move them to a point where they believe that by behaving in this manner, then that is what creates real safety. No, just safe enough, real safety. Now, if we're in the business of influencing culture and we want to change people and, and use the well-trotted out phrase in this space is that culture's how we do things around here, when people start to believe that what they're doing is the right thing, then they start to tell other people about it. They become advocates themselves. So the cu culture itself actually becomes self-educating and self-motivating. So, and I would suggest to you that the diagnostics that we've done at the moment, uh, the kind of uh, analysis, maybe not the right phrase, but we're consistently uh, checking when people come through the training programmes about where they are, what their levels are. Uh, and, and it's somewhere between the bottom part of awareness and understanding that's probably is good. Unfortunately, if you actually want to move beyond that, then you're actually into the engineering community. And then they do have a deep understanding of it. But unfortunately, most of the time, they're disconnected for the people that are doing the work. And the whole point of actually creating a process safety culture is, and, and that's why the, the proposition at the beginning, process safety, culture or competence or culture. It's quite an interesting uh, debate because if you talk to engineers, they'll tell you every day, the week and twice on a Sunday, it's competence. And then when you actually get nearer to where activities take place, there's a really, really strong argument that if you actually create a process safety culture, then you can really heavily influence this space. If you give people some knowledge, some understanding, and, and significantly here, uh, the information, and I've said that a number of times, and I'll keep saying it, the information's already available. We've already told people what the dangers are here, the significant dangers, and we've already got a plan on how to actually stop that from happening. That information needs to be socialised, and then it needs to be made important. Uh, and, and some of the things that we've seen as a consequence of this is more challenge coming in. When people become more informed, actually start saying, well, I'm not too sure that I'm going to do that now. And when you actually start to create that within the culture, then there's a real need for the senior leadership to actually have a level of maturity to be able to cope with that. Yeah. Because the people that are actually offering up the challenge can put some context around the, the challenge and they, they become more informed at that point. 